Hi, my name is Kevin Backhouse and I'm a member of GitHub Security Lab. In this short presentation, I'm going to try to give you some tips on how to get started in security research. I do want to start with an apology though. I was a professional software developer for 15 years before I got started in security research. I expect many of you who are watching this are younger than me, and so my story of how I got into security research as a kind of mid-career pivot isn't necessarily going to be all that relevant to you. But one of the things I want to emphasize is I don't think there is a standard path in security. I kind of got into it by accident myself, and I really enjoy it, and so I want to encourage any of you who are watching this to consider giving it a try. Security is kind of an unusual field. Some of the most accomplished security researchers in the world uh, were either self-taught or did not come from a formal computer science background. Two of the most talented researchers I know actually studied journalism in college. Now, I did study computer science, and so I'm certainly not trying to argue that a computer science degree has no value. But I do wonder whether maybe some of the personality traits that make certain people particularly good at spotting security vulnerabilities are maybe things that they can't teach you in college. So I thought I'd start with the story of how I got my first CVE. This is uh, an excerpt of a security bulletin published by Apple in 2017. So every time they release a new version of Mac OS or iOS, they publish one of these bulletins which has a list of vulnerabilities that were fixed and they acknowledge the people that found them. And that's my name down there in the bottom. Now, if you haven't heard the acronym CVE before, it stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. So every time a vulnerability is found, a unique CVE ID is assigned to it and it's useful for tracking and it's also very useful for systems administrators uh, so that they can check whether the software that they're running contains any known vulnerabilities. And really my main job as a security researcher is to get CVEs. I kind of like it because it makes my job very measurable. I can track my performance by the number of CVEs that I'm getting. Now of course some CVEs are a much bigger deal than others but I know that as long as I've got a reasonably steady stream of CVEs coming in, that I'm doing okay. So getting back to my first CVE, back in 2017, I was on the C and C++ analysis team at SAML. That was before SAML was acquired by GitHub. And at that time, we were beginning to realize that CodeQL had a lot of potential as a tool for finding security vulnerabilities. That's because it's... Uh, very easy to create new custom queries. And so that means that it's realistic to write a CodeQL query that is designed to look for a specific kind of bug in a specific code base. Now, we were a startup, and so we were always looking for new customers, and we were particularly keen to sign up high-profile tech companies like Apple. So we decided to try writing some custom queries for the XNU kernel. So XNU is the kernel used by both macOS and iOS. I started by looking at the results of our default queries. And one of the things that stood out at me was that this file called dtrace.c had an unusually large number of results. Now, at that time, a lot of our default queries were not focus so much on security and more on things like code cleanliness. So a lot of the results that those uh, queries were finding were not security vulnerabilities and in many cases not even bugs. Uh, but the fact that they there were so many in this particular file drew my attention to it. And so I decided to take a closer look. And to my amazement, I discovered that it contained an interpreter. So you can see here that it's reading instructions out of an array and then evaluating them. And so what this means is that somebody has made it possible for me to write a script and have that script get executed by an interpreter that lives inside the kernel. Now, I'm not an operating system expert, but I've always assumed that they're written very conservatively and designed to be absolutely bulletproof. And so it was mind blowing to me to discover that there was an interpreter just sat there in the code. So I have this Venn diagram in my mind. If you were to think about all the developers in the world, 
Then there's going to be a subset of those developers who are particularly meticulous and are very good at writing code that doesn't contain any bugs. There's also going to be a group of developers who think it's a great idea to embed an interpreter in security critical software. So that team over there are responsible for numerous dumpster fires, including modern web browsers. Now, I'm not saying that the intersection between these circles is empty, but I am saying it's small. So I was absolutely convinced that I was going to be able to find a bug in dtrace.c in that interpreter. So what I did was a combination of manual audit and writing custom, a custom code QL query. So it was clear to me that I could completely control the values in this array called regs. And so what I was interested in is whether one of those values from regs that I could control could flow to a place where it could cause something bad to happen. So for example, be used in an unbound check array access, for example. So let me show you the code QR query that I wrote. So over here is the query. And so it's using a data flow it's using data flow to find paths from sources to sinks. And as the sources, I've defined this class called register access, which finds places where we're reading from the regs array. And then for the sinks, it's looking for places where there's some kind of pointer access. And over here on the left, you can see the uh, result of that query, the interesting result of that query. And so down here, this is where it's doing a pointer dereference on um, something with arg in it. And if you trace that back, you can see that that came from there, which came from this function call, which came from that parameter, which came from here, which is this access of the regs array. And so it turns out that you could get the kernel to read from kernel memory at an arbitrary offset by setting the value of of regs at um, position R2. Now, I mentioned earlier that one of the things I like about security research is how measurable it is. You can rate your performance by the number of CVEs that you're finding. And I think that this focus on concrete indisputable evidence is one of the themes of the field. Um, this is our motto. So people in security research have had absolutely no time for the kind of abstract pontificating that academics sometimes like to do. If you want to claim that you found a security vulnerability, you have to prove it by creating a POC, which stands for proof of concept. So over on the right hand side here, this is the an excerpt of the POC that I wrote for the dtrace vulnerability. And if you want to see the full thing, then you can go to this, this URL. Now, writing this POC was actually quite a lot of work. Dtrace uses uh, an object format somewhat like the ELF object format on Linux. And so I had to figure out how to create a, a valid Dtrace file in order to trigger this bug. Um, and I didn't know how to debug the Mac OS kernel. So what I ended up doing was extracting the parsing code from the source code in order to create a little test harness so that I could test the dtrace files that I was generating to try and check that they were valid. But when I finally thought I had a, a dtrace file that would trigger the bug, I tried running it on a real Mac and nothing happened. It was one of those cases where there wasn't even an error message, it was just nothing. And it took me several more days of studying the code the source code of the kernel to figure out what I'd done wrong and how to fix it. And I was on the point of giving up before I finally managed to crash the kernel. So this is what that looks like. Now, I stopped there. Once I got to the point where I had a POC that was able to crash the kernel, I didn't then continue and create an exploit that was able to do something like escalate privileges. And I think that's generally considered OK. Once you've got a POC that can cause something clearly bad to happen, then that's sufficient to get a CVE. But you definitely get higher marks for creating a full exploit that actually does something like escalating privileges. 
And so recently, uh, that's something that I've really been focusing on doing. Um, and a, it, a lot of it is because I want to be able to call myself a true security expert. And I feel that in order to be able to claim that, I need to understand how to write exploits. So that's the end of my story about how I got my first CVE. What happened next was that Uche de Moore, who was the founder and CEO of Semmel, decided that it would be quite a good idea for the company to have a small security research team. And he asked me and my colleague Manu Mo if we'd like to become full-time security researchers. I was a bit apprehensive about it at first because this bug definitely felt like a fluke to me when I found it. And I wasn't convinced that I was going to be able to find anything else like it. But over time, what I've learned is that almost all software contains vulnerabilities. And if you look hard enough, then eventually you'll find one of those vulnerabilities. Now, I want to just explain a bit about the, the security field as a whole. I've specialized in a very small part of it. Um, in particular, I'm in the secure code area, which means that my job is to look at source code and try to find bugs in those source code. So there are many other areas outside of that, for example, multi-factor authentication, uh, automatic phishing detection, antivirus, even physical security that are outside my areas of expertise. Um, within source secure code, as GitHub Security Lab, we focus exclusively on open source code. So that's quite a big distinction with other security research teams who are often reverse engineering proprietary source code to find vulnerabilities in them. And I, as a former developer, I'm particularly comfortable with C and C++, so that's what I tend to focus on. If you are not already familiar with those languages, then I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you try to get into that niche because in the modern world, languages like JavaScript and Python are becoming increasingly important. And so it might be more profitable to focus on those. So when I talked about the, the D-Trace vulnerability, I talked about two of the techniques that I use, which are static analysis or CodeQL in my case, and manual audit. There's a third technique, which I don't use so much myself, but is often incredibly effective, and that's fuzzing. The idea of fuzzing is to hammer an application with randomly generated inputs until it causes a crash. And I think the reason why this is so effective is because often when developers are writing their code, they test it with valid inputs and they forget to think about what might happen if the code were presented with an invalid input. So the way that a fuzzer often works is it starts with a number of valid inputs and it starts making small changes to them to see what other code paths might get triggered by that. And they're often able to uncover weird edge cases that sometimes turn out to be exploitable. I think fuzzing is particularly effective on dense file formats like images, because if you make a small change to an image file, there's, it's quite likely to still be at least partially valid, and that might then trigger a new code path and uncover one of those edge cases. Probably the most well-known fuzzer is called AFL, so I'm going to show you a quick demo of how easy it is to get started with AFL. So I'm going to show you how to run a fuzzer on Exif2, which is a project that I've occasionally helped out with. So what you have to do is you have to rebuild the application with an AFL specific compiler. So you can see here AFL Clang Fast is the compiler that we're going to use. And I've also switched on ASAN, which stands for address sanitization. And that's going to help to find bugs like buffer overflows in the code. So then we just run make on that. And then over here in the other window, so I've got a directory that contains a number of image files to use as, as seeds for the fuzzing. And then we can run the fuzzer like that. And so here it's scanning through those input files, creating up, creating initial database to, to use for testing. And in a second or so, it should be done with that and it will be ready to go. So you're typically, typically going to need to leave AFL running for 
um, hours if not days um, and when it starts finding crashes it will start to show that here. With a bit of luck you shouldn't find anything on EXIF2 because I've already run uh, AFL and I think I found everything um, but the instructions should be uh, the, pretty much the same for other projects as well. So I wrote a blog post earlier this year which has detailed instructions on how to run that demo on EXIF2. Um, I do recommend if you're going to try those grab yourself uh, an Ubuntu 1804 VM because those instructions were written for Ubuntu 1804 so hopefully they'll work straight out of the box if you if you have an 1804 VM. Uh, I also recommend if you're interested in fuzzing then my colleague Antonio Morales has written a number of really good blog posts about it. This is the first of those and there are more if you go to this URL. Okay so there's a couple of final points I want to make about the techniques that I've mentioned. Static analysis and fuzzing are quite different approaches to finding bugs. Static analysis is really good for scanning large code bases and finding interesting places to look. And what I've often found when I've used CodeQL is that I've had to then work backwards from a potential bug to figure out how to trigger it. So for example, last year I found a vulnerability in Facebook's TLS implementation. And it was an on, on an, a code path that wasn't normally executed. And so I had to work backwards and figure out uh, some unusual options that you had to send to the TLS server that would cause that code path to get triggered. Now with fuzzing it's the opposite way around. You start by identifying what the entry points are into the program and then you point a fuzzer at it and it will then start to explore the code paths that are reachable from those entry points. But I think that no matter what you do, no matter how you find the bug, you always end up doing some manual audit. Um, and that's partly because when you do find a bug, you need to thoroughly understand why that bug happened so that you can write a helpful bug report to send to the maintainers of the project. But also, of course, if you are planning on writing an exploit for the vulnerability, then you're going to have to really understand that area of the code in order to figure out how to exploit it. In the abstract that I wrote for this talk, I said I was going to talk about the bug finding techniques that I use, but I also said I was going to talk about the difference in mindset between a security researcher and a developer. In popular culture, there's this image of what a hacker looks like. I've included some examples on this slide. Now, I don't look like that. Maybe I should try wearing more black clothes. I don't think I'm going to be able to pull off that hair, but I could maybe try getting some tattoos and piercings. I wonder what my kids would think of that. Jokes aside though, I don't think that this image of what a hacker is is completely wrong. I think there's an anti-establishment mentality that is really important. As a security researcher or hacker, you do have the ability to embarrass huge, powerful companies, but you can only do that if you don't believe their hype. You have to be convinced that they've got bugs in their code and be willing to keep hammering at it until you find them. The reality of security research is a lot more boring than what you see in the movies, though. This is one of my favorite tweets. It's from Ned Williamson, who's one of the Google Project Zero researchers. And this is actually one of the things that I really enjoy about security research. It's since becoming a security researcher, I've actually learned about all kinds of software that I'd never bothered to look at before. So it's making me much more knowledgeable about how the technology around me works. I do have a word of warning about what it's like to be a security researcher. It feels to me a lot like a competition. You don't get to rest on your laurels for very long. There's a brief moment of triumph after you've found a bug where you get to publish your exploit video on Twitter and write a blog post about it. But then that bug is burned and you're back to square one looking for a new one. And I know from experience that sometimes you go periods of time where, through periods of time where you're just not finding anything. I think maybe it's a bit like being a professional baseball player. They sometimes go through slumps where they're just not getting any hits, sometimes for weeks on end. And so that can make it quite high pressure. And people do burn out. So please take care of yourself 
And remember that it's actually a slow grind. You just have to keep looking and keep working at it and eventually you will find the bugs. So let's answer the question that we started with. How do you get started in security research? My recommendation is choose a project to focus on and really study how that project works. Um, I recommend going for something open source because then you can read the source code, which makes it a little bit easier to figure out what's what's happening. Um, you can also uh, go on the bug bounty programs like HackerOne, for example, to get recommendations. I would suggest that you don't try looking at something really high profile like Chrome or Firefox because a lot of security researchers have already looked at those projects and so the bar to finding something new is really quite high. And of course use all the tools that are at your disposal, static analysis, manual audit, fuzzing, anything that you can, can do to help you find the bugs. If you do find a bug then here's a few tips on how to report that properly. So first of all if at all possible, try and report it privately. Posting an issue publicly on their GitHub repo is a last resort if you can't find an email address to send it to. Always be polite. And I think the third one is particularly important. Clear reproduction steps are so important. So a POC that is easy for the maintainer to run and confirm that what you're saying is true. Try to explain the bug so that they understand what it is that they need to do to fix it and explain why it's a security issue. And um, it's probably a good idea to include your disclosure policy. So 90 days until public disclosure is the kind of usual thing. And you can take a look at our security policy to use as an example. So for my final slide, I made a little hacker glossary. I think the security world has always had a lot of inside jokes and terminology, or since 1992 AD, as my colleague Bass would probably say. So these are a couple of the things that I've had to look up. Hopefully they'll be helpful to you too. Thanks for watching.